Daisy by Francis Thompson Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Where the thistle lifts a purple crown Six foot out of the turf And the harebell shakes on the windy hill O breath of the distant surf The hills look over on the south And southward dreams the sea And with the sea breeze hand in hand Came innocence and she where mid the gorse the raspberry red for the gatherer springs two children did we stray and talk wise idle childish things she listened with big-lipped surprise breast a deep mid flower and spine her skin was like a grape whose veins run snow instead of wine she knew not those sweet words she spake nor knew her own sweet way but there's never a bird so sweet a song thronged in whose throat all day oh there were flowers in storrington on the turf and on the spray but the sweetest flower on sussex hills was the daisy flower that day her beauty smoothed earth's furrowed face she gave me tokens three a look a word of her winsome mouth and a wild raspberry a berry red a guileless look a still word strings of sand and yet they made my wild wild heart fly down to her little hand for standing artless as the air and candid as the skies she took the berries with her hand and the love with her sweet eyes the fairest things have fleetest end their scent survives their clothes but the rose's scent is bitterness to him that loved the rose. She looked a little wistfully, then went her sunshine way. The sea's eye had a mist on it, and the leaves fell from that day. She went her unremembering way, she went, and left in me the pang of all the partings gone, and partings yet to be. She left me marvelling why my soul was sad that she was glad at all the sadness in the sweet, the sweetness in the sad. Still, still I seem to see her, still look up with soft replies, and take the berries with her hand, and the love with her lovely eyes. Nothing begins, and nothing ends, that is not paid with moan, for we are born in others' pain, and perish in our own. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Fallen Brave by George Pope Morris Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk From cypress and from laurel Boughs are twined in sorrow and in pride the leaves that deck the mouldering brows of those who for their country died in sorrow that the sable pall enfolds the valiant and the brave in pride that those who nobly fall win garlands that adorn the grave the onset the pursuit the roar of victory or the routed foe will startle from their rest no more the fallen brave of mexico to god alone such spirits yield he took them in their strength and bloom when gathering on the tented field the garlands woven for the tomb the shrouded flag the drooping spear the muffled drum the solemn bell the funeral train the dirge the bier the mourners sad and last farewell are fading tributes to the worth of those whose deeds this homage claim but time who mingles them with earth keeps green the garlands of their fame end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Green Hand Rouseabout by Henry Lawson Read for LibriVox.org by Son of the Exiles The Green Hand Rouseabout 
call this hot? I beg your pardon, hot? You don't know what it means. What's that, waiter? Lamb or mutton? Thank you, mine is beef and greens. Bread and butter while I'm waiting. Milk? Oh, yes, a bucket full. I'm just in from west the darling, picking up and rolling wool. Mutton stewed or chops for breakfast, dry and tasteless, boiled in fat. Bread or brownie, tea or coffee, two hours graft in front of that. Legs of mutton boiled for dinner, mutton greasy warm for tea, mutton curried. Gave my order, beef and plenty greens for me. Breakfast, curried rice and mutton till your innard sacrifice and you sicken at the colour and the smell of curried rice all day long with living mutton bits and belly wool and fleece blinded by the yoke of wool and shirts and trousers stiff with grease till you long for sight of verdure cabbage plots and water clear and you crave for beef and butter as a boozer craves for beer Dusty patch in baking mulga, glaring iron hut and shed, feel and smell of rain forgotten, water scarce and feed grass dead, hot and suffocating sunrise, all pervading sheepyard smell, stiff and aching green hand stretches, slushy rings the bullock bell, pint of tea and hunk of brownie, sinners string towards the shed, great black greasy crows round carcass screen behind of dust cloud red engine whistles go at tigers and the agony begins picking up for seven devils out of hades for my sins picking up for seven devils seven demons out of hell sell their souls to get the bell sheep half a dozen christs they sell day grows hot as where they come from too damned hot for men or brutes roof of corrugated iron six foot six above the chutes whiz and rattle and vibration like an endless chain of trams blasphemy of five and forty prickly heat and stink of rams baku leaves his pen door open and the sheep come bucking out when the rouser goes to pen them Baku blasts the rouse about. Injury with insult added, trial of our cursing powers. Cursed and cursing back enough to damn a dozen worlds like ours. Take my combs down to the grinder, will you? Soon my cattle pup. There's a sheep fell down in my chute. Just jump down and pick it up. If the office when the boss comes, catch that gory sheep, old man. Count the sheep in my pen, will you? Fetch my combs back when you can. When you get a chance, old fella, will you pop down to the hut? Fetch my pipe, the cook'll show you, and I'll let you have a cut. Shearer yells for tar and needle, ringers roaring like a bull. Wool away, you son of angels, where the hell's the foundling wool? Pound a week and station prices, mustn't kick against the pricks, seven weeks of lurid mateship ruined soul and four pounds six what's that waiter me stuffed mutton look here waiter to be brief i said beef you blood-stained villain beef moo cow roast bullock beef end of poem this recording is in the public domain grown up by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org By Shakira January 2016 Was it for this I uttered prayers And sobbed and cursed and kicked the stairs That now, domestic as a plate, I should retire at half-past eight? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Is It Done? by Ella Wheeler Wilcox Read for LibriVox.org by Shakira January 2016 It is done in the fire's fitful flashes The last line has withered and curled 
in a tiny white heap of dead ashes, lie buried the hopes of your world. There were mad foolish vows in each letter. It is well they have shriveled and burned. And the ring, oh, the ring was a fetter. It was better removed and returned. But ah, is it done? In the embers, where letters and tokens were cast, have you burned up the heart that remembers and treasures its beautiful past? Do you think in this swift, reckless fashion to ruthlessly burn and destroy the months that were freighted with passion, the dreams that were drunken with joy? Can you burn up the rapture of kisses that flashed from the lips to the soul, or the heart that grew sick for lost blisses in spite of its strength of control? Have you burned up the touch of warm fingers that thrilled through each pulse and each vein, or the sound of a voice that still lingers and hurts with a haunting refrain? Is it done? Is the life drama ended? You have put all the lights out, and yet, though the curtain, rung down, has descended, can the actors go home and forget? Ah, no, they will turn in their sleeping, with a strange restless pain in their hearts, and in darkness and anguish and weeping will dream they are playing their parts. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lines written after a very severe tempest which cleared up extremely pleasant by Mercy Otis Warren. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. When rolling thunders shake the skies and lightnings fly from pole to pole, when threatening whirlwinds rend the air, what terrors seize the affrighted soul? Aghast and pale with thrilling fear, he trembling stands in wild amaze, nor knows for shelter where to hide to screen him from the livid blaze. Happy the calm and tranquil breast that with a steady, equal mind can view those flying shafts of death with heart and will at once resigned. O oh, thou supreme eternal king at whose command the tempests rage with equal ease can worlds destroy, or with a word the storm assuage and though impetuous tempests roar and penetrating flames surround thou bidst them cease the thunders hushed and rest and silence reign profound thus have we seen thy power and might adoring we thy work survey tis thou directest the pointed flame and thus thy goodness dost display Thou hast composed the rapid winds, and lulled to rest the foaming wave. The clouds dispersed, each twinkling star proclaims aloud thy power to save. The silver moon, the glorious orbs that swim aloft in boundless space, their rays resplendent all unite to celebrate at once thy praise. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ne Plus Ultra by Samuel Taylor Coleridge Read for LibriVox.org by Karen Joan Kahodic Octoberzine.blogspot.com Soul positive of night, antipathist of light, Fate's only essence, primal scorpion rod, The one permitted opposite of God, Condensed blackness and abysmal storm, Compacted to one scepter, arms the grasp enorm, The interceptor, the substance that still casts the shadow, death, the dragon foul and fell, the unrevealable and hidden one whose breath gives wind and fuel to the fires of hell. Ah, sole despair of both the eternities in heaven, sole interdict of all bedewing prayer, the all compassionate, save to the lampid seven, revealed to none of all the angelic state, save to the lampid seven that watch the throne of heaven. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Old Oaken Bucket by Samuel Woodworth Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Old Oaken Bucket How dear to this heart are the scenes of my childhood, When fond recollection presents them to view, The orchard, the meadow, the deep tangled wildwood, And every loved spot which my infancy knew, The wide spreading pond and the mill that stood by it, the bridge and the rock where the cataract fell, the cot of my father, the dairy house nigh it, and even the rude bucket that hung in the well. The old oaken bucket, the iron-bound bucket, the moss-covered bucket which hung in the well. That moss-covered vessel I hailed as a treasure, for often at noon, when returned from the field, I found it the source of an exquisite pleasure, the purest and sweetest that nature can yield. How ardent I seized it, with hands that were glowing, and quick to the white pebbled bottom it fell. Then soon, with the emblem of truth overflowing, and dripping with coolness, it rose from the well. The old oaken bucket, the iron-bound bucket, the moss-covered bucket arose from the well. How sweet from the green mossy brim to receive it, as poised on the curb it inclined to my lips. Not a full blushing goblet could tempt me to leave it, the brightest that beauty or revelry sips. And now, far removed from the loved habitation, the tear of regret will intrusively swell, as fancy reverts to my father's plantation and sighs for the bucket that hangs in the well. The old oaken bucket, the iron-bound bucket, the moss-covered bucket that hangs in the well. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Act three, scene three of Othello, Iago, by William Shakespeare, part one. Read for LibriVox.org by John Burlinson as Othello. Tony Addison as Iago. Excellent wretch! Perdition catch my soul, but I do love thee, and when I love thee not, chaos is come again. My noble lord, what dost thou say, Iago? Did my poor Cassio, when you wooed my lady, know of your love? He did, from first to last. Why dost thou ask? But for a satisfaction of my thought, no further harm. Why of thy thought, Iago? I did not think he had been acquainted with her. Oh, yes, and went between us very oft. Indeed. Indeed? Ay, indeed. Discernst thou aught in that? See, is he not honest? Honest, my lord? Honest? Ay, honest. My lord, for aught I know. What dost thou think? Think, my lord? Think, my lord? By heaven, he echoes me as if there were some monster in his thought too hideous to be shown. Thou dost mean something. I heard thee say even now, thou likest not that, when Cassio left my wife. What didst not like? And when I told thee he was of my counsel in my whole course of wooing, thou criedst, Indeed? And didst contract and purse thy brow together as if thou then hadst shut up in thy brain some horrible conceit. If thou dost love me, show me thy thought. My lord, you know I love you. I think thou dost, and for I know thou art full of love and honesty, and waste thy words before thou gist them breath. Therefore these stops of thine fright me the more. For such things in a false disloyal knave are tricks of custom, but in a man that's just they're close dilations, working from the heart that 
passion cannot rule. For Michael Cassio, I dare be sworn. I think that he is honest. I think so, too. Men should be what they seem, or those that be not, would they might seem none. Certain, men should be what they seem. Why, then, I think Cassio's an honest man. Nay, yet there's more in this. I prithee, speak to me as to thy thinkings, as thou dost ruminate, and give thy worst of thoughts the worst of words. Good, my lord, pardon me. Though I am bound to every act of duty, I am not bound to that all slaves are free to. Utter my thoughts. Why say they are vile and false? As where's that palace, whereunto foul things sometimes intrude not? Who has a breast so pure, but some uncleanly apprehensions keep leets and law days, and in sessions sit with meditations lawful? Thou dost conspire against thy friend Iago, if thou but think'st him wronged and mak'st his ear a stranger to thy thoughts? I do beseech you. Though I perchance am vicious in my guess, As I confess, it is my nature's play To spy into abuses, And oft my jealousy shapes faults that are not, That your wisdom yet, From one that so imperfectly conceits, Would take no notice, nor build yourself a trouble out of his scattering and unsure observance. It were not for your quiet, nor your good, nor for my manhood, honesty, or wisdom, to let you know my thoughts. What dost thou mean? Good name! in man and woman dear my lord is the immediate jewel of their souls who steals my purse steals trash tis something nothing twas mine tis his and has been slave to thousands but he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and makes me poor indeed by heaven, I'll know thy thoughts. You cannot, if my heart were in your hand, nor shall not, whilst is in my custody. Ha! Ah. Oh, beware, my lord, of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. That cuckold lives in bliss, who, certain of his fate, loves not his wronger, but oh, what damned minutes tells he o'er, Who dotes yet doubts, suspects yet strongly loves. Oh, misery! Poor and content is rich, and rich enough, But rich is fineless, is as poor as winter, To him that ever fears he shall be poor. Good heaven, the souls of all my tribe, defend from jealousy why why is this think'st thou i'd make a life of jealousy to follow still the changes of the moon with fresh suspicions no to be once in doubt is once to be resolved exchange me for a goat when i shall turn the business of my soul to such exsufflicate and blown surmises matching thy inference tis not to make me jealous to say my wife is fair feeds well loves company is free of speech sings plays and dances well where virtue is these are more virtuous 
nor from mine own weak merits will i draw the smallest fear doubt of her revolt for she had eyes chose me no iago i'll see before i doubt when i doubt prove and on the proof there is no more but this away at once with love or jealousy i am glad of it for now i shall have reason to show the love and duty that i bear you with franker spirit therefore as i am bound receive it from me i speak not yet of proof look to your wife observe her well with cassio wear your eye thus not jealous nor secure i would not have your free and noble nature out of self-bounty be abused look to it i know our country disposition well in venice they do let heaven see the pranks they dare not show their husbands their best conscience is not to leave it undone but keep it unknown dost thou say so she did deceive her father marrying you and when she seemed to shake and fear your looks she loved them most and so she did why go to then she that so young could give out such a seeming to seal her father's eyes up close as oak he thought twas witchcraft but i am much to blame i humbly do beseech you of your pardon for too much loving you i am bound to thee for ever i see this hath a little dashed your spirits not a jot not a jot if faith i fear it has i hope you will consider what is spoke comes from my love but i do see your mood i am to pray you not to strain my speech to grosser issues nor to larger reach than to suspicion i will not should you do so my lord my speech should fall into such vile success which my thoughts aim not at cassio's my worthy friend my lord i see you're moved no not much moved i do not think but desdemona's honest long live she so and long live you to think so and yet how nature erring from itself ay there's the point as to be bold with you not to affect many proposed matches of her own clime complexion and degree whereto we see in all things nature tends for one may smell in such a will most rank foul disproportion thoughts unnatural but pardon me i do not in position distinctly speak of her though i may fear her will recoiling to her better judgment may fall to match you with her country forms and happily repent farewell farewell if more thou dost perceive let me know more set on thy wife to observe leave me iago my lord i take my leave why did i marry this honest creature doubtless sees and knows more much more than he unfolds my lord i would i might entreat your honour to scan this thing no further leave it to time though it be fit that cassio have his place for sure he fills it up with great ability yet if you please to hold him off a while you shall by that perceive him and his means note if your lady strain his entertainment with any strong or vehement importunity much will be seen in that in the meantime let me be thought too busy in my fears 
as worthy cause I have to fear I am, and hold her free, I do beseech your honour. Fear not my government. I once more take my leave. This fellow's of exceeding honesty, and knows all qualities with a learned spirit of human dealings. If I do prove her haggard, though that her jesses were my dear heart's strings, I'd whistle her off and let her down the wind to pray at fortune. Haply, for I am black and have not those soft parts of conversation that chamberers have, or, for I am declined into the veil of years, yet that's not much. She's gone. I am abused, and my relief must be to loathe her. Oh, curse of marriage, that we can call these delicate creatures ours, and not their appetites! I had rather be a toad and live upon the vapour of a dungeon than keep a corner in the thing I love for others' uses. Yet, tis the plague of great ones. Prerogative are they less than the base. Tis destiny unshunnable, a death. End of Othello Iago Act three, scene three, part one. This recording is in the public domain. Act three, scene three of Othello Iago by William Shakespeare, part two. Read for LibriVox.org by John Burlinson as Othello, Tony Addison as Iago. Not Poppy, nor Mandragora, nor all the drowsy syrups of the world shall ever medicine thee to that sweet sleep which thou owedst yesterday. Ha! Ha! False to me! Why, how now, General? No more of that. I won't! Be gone! Thou hast set me on the wreck. I swear tis better to be much abused than but to know to little. How now, my lord? What sense had I of her stolen hours of lust? I sought not thought it not it harmed not me i slept the next night well was free and merry i found not cassio's kisses on her lips he that is robbed not wanting what is stolen let him not note and he's not robbed at all i am sorry to hear this i had been happy if the general camp Pioneers and all had tasted her sweet body, so I had nothing known. Oh, now forever farewell the tranquil mind, farewell content, farewell the plumed troop and the big wars that make ambition virtue. Oh, farewell, farewell the neighing steed and the shrill trump, the spirit-stirring drum, the ear-piercing fife, the royal banner, and all quality, pride, pomp, and circumstance of glorious war. And, O oh, you mortal engines, whose rude throats the immortal Jove's dread clamours counterfeit, farewell! Othello's occupation's gone! Is it possible, my lord? Villain! Be sure thou prove my love a whore. Be sure of it. 
give me the ocular proof or by the worth of man's eternal soul thou hadst been better have been born a dog than answer my wicked wrath is come to this make me to see it or at the least so prove it that the probation bear no hinge nor loop to hang a doubt on or woe upon thy life my noble lord if thou dost slander her and torture me never pray more abandon all remorse on horror's head horrors accumulate do deeds to make heaven weep all earth amazed for nothing canst thou to damnation add greater than that o oh, grace o oh, heaven defend me are you a man have you a soul or sense god be with you take mine office o oh, wretched fool that livest to make thine honesty a vice o oh, monstrous world take note take note o oh, world to be direct and honest is not safe i thank you for this profit and from hence i'll love no friend sith loves breed such offence nay stay thou shouldst be honest i should be wise for honest is a fool and loses that it works for by the world i think my wife be honest and think she is not I think that thou art just, and think thou art not. I'll have some proof. Her name, that was as fresh as Diane's visage, is now begrimed and black as mine own face. If there be cords or knives, poison or fire or suffocating streams, I'll not endure it. Would I were satisfied. I see, sir you are eaten up with passion i do repent me that i put it to you you would be satisfied would nay i will and may but how how satisfied my lord would you the supervisor grossly gape on behold her topped death and damnation oh it were a tedious difficulty i think to bring them to that prospect damn them then if ever mortal eyes do see them bolster more than their own what then how then what shall i say where's satisfaction it is impossible you should see this were they as prime as goats as hot as monkeys as salt as wolves in pride and fools as gross as ignorance made drunk but yet i say if imputation and strong circumstances which lead directly to the door of truth will give you satisfaction you may have it give me a living reason she's disloyal i do not like the office but sith i am entered in this cause so far pricked to it by foolish honesty and love i will go on i lay with cassio lately and being troubled with a raging tooth i could not sleep there are a kind of men so loose of soul that in their sleep will mutter their affairs one of this kind is cassio in sleep i heard him say sweet desdemona let us be wary let us hide our loves and then sir would he gripe and wring my hand cry o oh, sweet creature and then kissed me hard 
as if he plucked up kisses by the roots that grew upon my lips then laid his leg over my thigh and sighed and kissed and then cried cursed faith that gave thee to the mob oh monstrous monstrous nay this was but his dream but this denoted a foregone conclusion tis a shrewd doubt though it be but a dream and this may help to thicken other proofs that do demonstrate sinly i'll tear her all to pieces nay but be wise yet we see nothing done she may be honest yet tell me but this have you not sometimes seen a handkerchief spotted with strawberries in your wife's hand i gave her such a one twas my first gift i know not that but such a handkerchief i am sure it was your wife's did i to-day see cassio wipe his beard with if it be that if it be that or any that was hers it speaks against her with the other proofs oh that the slave had forty thousand lives one is too poor too weak for my revenge now do i see tis true look here iago all my fond love thus do i blow to heaven is gone arise black vengeance from thy hollow hell yield up o love thy crown and hearted throne to tyrannous hate swell bosom with thy fraught for tis of aspic's tongues yet be content o blood 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 patience i say your mind perhaps may change never iago like to the pontic sea whose icy current and compulsive course ne'er feels retiring ebb but keeps due on to the propontic and the hellespont even so my bloody thoughts with violent pace shall ne'er look back ne'er ebb to humble love till that a capable and wide revenge swallow them up now by yond marble heaven in the due reverence of a sacred vow i here engage my words do not rise yet witness you ever burning lights above you elements that clip us round about witness that here iago doth give up the execution of his wit hands heart to wronged othello's service let him command and to obey shall be in me remorse what bloody business ever i greet thy love not with vain thanks but with acceptance bounteous and will upon the instant put thee to it within these three days let me hear thee say that cassio's not alive my friend is dead tis done at your request but let her live damn her lewd minx oh damn her come go with me apart i will withdraw to furnish me with some swift means of death for the fair devil now art thou my lieutenant i am your own for ever end of othello iago at three scene three part two this recording is in the public domain
Other Days by Lewis Morris. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. O oh, thrush, your song is passing sweet, but never a song that you have sung is half so sweet as thrushes sang when my dear love and I were young. O oh, roses, you are sweet and red, yet not so red nor sweet as were the roses that my mistress loved to bind within her flowing hair. Time filches fragrance from the flower, Time steals the sweetness from the song. Love only scorns the tyrant's power, And with the growing years grows strong. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Painter on Silk by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Painter on Silk There was a man who made his living by painting roses upon silk. He sat in an upper chamber and painted, and the noises of the street meant nothing to him. When he heard bugles and fifes and drums, he thought of red and yellow and white roses bursting in the sunshine, and smiled as he worked. He thought only of roses and silk. When he could get no more silk, he stopped painting and only thought of roses. The day the conquerors entered the city, the old man lay dying. He heard the bugles and drums and wished he could paint the roses bursting into sound. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Service of Song by Emily Dickinson Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Some keep the Sabbath going to church, I keep it staying at home, with a bobolink for a chorister and an orchard for a dome. Some keep the Sabbath in surplus, I just wear my wings, and instead of tolling the bell for church, our little sexton sings. God preaches, a noted clergyman, and the sermon is never long. So instead of getting to heaven at last, I'm going all along. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Seventy six by George Pope Morris. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. Before the battle. The clarion call of liberty rings on the startled gales. The rising hills reverberate the rising of the vales. Through all the land the thrilling shout swift as an arrow goes. Columbia's champions arm and out to battle with her foes. After the battle, the bugle song of victory is vocal in the air the strains by warrior voices breathed are echoed by the fair the eagle with the wreath blood-bought soars proudly to the sun proclaiming the good fight is fought and the great victory won end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Song of Courtesy by George Meredith Read for LibriVox.org by John Burlinson When Sir Gawain was led to his bridal bed By Arthur's knights in scorn God sped, How think you he felt? Oh, the bride within was yellow and dry As a snake's old skin, loathly as sin scarcely faceable quite unembraceable with a hog's bristle on a hag's chin gentle gawain felt as should we little of love's soft fire knew he 
but he was the knight of courtesy when that evil lady he lay beside bade him turn to greet his bride what think you he did oh to spare her pain and let not his loathing her loathliness vain mirror too plain sadly sighingly almost dyingly turned he and kissed her once and again like sir gawain gentles should we silent all but for pattern agree there's none like the knight of courtesy sir gawain sprang up amid laces and curls kisses are not wasted pearls what clung in his arms oh a maiden flower burning with blushes the sweet bride bower beauty her dower breathing perfumingly shall i live bloomingly said she by day or the bridal hour thereat he clasped her and whispered he thine rare bride the choice shall be said she twice blessed is courtesy of gentle sir gawain they had no sport when it was morning in arthur's court what think you they cried now life and eyes this bride is the very saint's dream of a prize fresh from the skies see ye not courtesy is the true alchemy turning to gold all it touches and tries like the true knight so may we make the basest that there be beautiful by courtesy end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet one hundred and sixteen by william shakespeare read for LibriVox.org by fabiola sonnet one hundred and sixteen let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove oh no it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken it is the star to every wandering bark whose words are known although his eye be taken love's not time's fool the rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come love alters not with his brief hours and weeks but bears it out even to the edge of doom if this be error and upon me proved i never read nor no man ever loved end of the poem this recording is in the public domain the sword and the staff by george pope morris read for LibriVox.org by bruce kachuk the sword of the hero the staff of the sage whose valor and wisdom are stamped on the age time hallowed mementos of those who have riven the scepter from tyrants the lightning from heaven this weapon o freedom was drawn by the sun and it never was sheathed till the battle was won no stain of dishonor upon it we see twas never surrendered except to the free while fame claims the hero and patriot sage their names to emblazon on history's page no holier relics will liberty hoard than franklin's staff guarded by washington's sword end of poem this recording is in the public domain Sympathy 
by Emily Bronte, read for LibriVox.org, by Fabiola. Sympathy There should be no despair for you, while nightly stars are burning, while evening pours its silent dew, and sunshine gilds the morning. There should be no despair, though tears may flow down like a river. Are not the best, beloved, the fears around your heart forever? They weep, you weep, it must be so. Winds sigh as you are sighing, and winter shed its grief in snow, where autumn's leaves are lying. Yet these revive, and from their fate your fate cannot be parted. Then journey on, if not elate. Still never broken hearted. End of the poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Friend by Amy Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Shakira. January 2016. I ask but one thing of you, only one that always you will be my dream of you, that never shall I wake to find untrue all this I have believed and rested on, forever vanished, like a vision gone out into the night. Alas, how few there are who strike in us a chord we knew existed, but so seldom heard its tone, we tremble at the half-forgotten sound. The world is full of rude awakenings, and heaven-born castles shattered to the ground. Yet still our human longing vainly clings to a belief in beauty through all wrongs. Oh, stay your hand, and leave my heart its songs. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Unattainable Lament of Muhammad Akram by Lawrence Hope. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. I would have taken golden stars from the sky for your necklace. I would have shaken rose leaves for your rest from all the rose trees. But you had no need. The short, sweet grass sufficed for your slumber and you took no heed of such trifles as gold or a necklace. There is an hour, at twilight, too heavy with memory. There is a flower that I fear, for your hair had its fragrance. I would have squandered youth for you, and its hope and its promise, before you wandered, careless, away from my useless passion. But what is the use of my speech, since I know of no words to recall you? I am praying that time may teach you your cruelty, me forgetfulness. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. What do poets want with gold? By Archibald Lampman. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. What do poets want with gold? What do poets want with gold? Cringing slaves and cushioned ease. Are not crusts and garments old better for their souls than these? Gold is but the juggling rod of a false usurping god, graven long ago in hell with a somber stony spell working in the world forever. Hate is not so strong to sever, beating human heart from heart. Soul from soul we shrink and part, and no longer hail each other with the ancient name of brother. Give the simple poet gold, and his song will die of cold. He must walk with men that reel on the rugged path, and feel every sacred soul that is beating very near to his. Simple, human, careless, free, as God made him, he must be. For the sweetest song of bird is the hidden tenor heard in the dusk at even flush from the forest's inner hush 
of the simple hermit thrush what do poets want with love flowers that shiver out of hand and the fervid fruits that prove only bitter broken sand poets speak of passion best when their dreams are undistressed and the sweetest songs are sung ever the inner heart is stung let them dream tis better so ever dream but never know if their spirits once have drained all that goblet crimson stained finding what they dreamed divine only earthly sluggish wine sooner will the warm lips pale and the flawless voices fail sooner come the drooping wing and the after days that bring no such songs as did the spring end of poem this recording is in the public domain when you are old by william butler yeats read for LibriVox.org by winston tharp when you are old and gray and full of sleep and nodding by the fire take down this book and slowly read and dream of the soft look your eyes had once and of their shadows deep how many loved your moments of glad grace and loved your beauty with love false or true but one man loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face and bending down beside the glowing bars murmur a little sadly how love fled and paced upon the mountains overhead and hid his face amid a crowd of stars and a poem this recording is in the public domain the wife of bath's tale the tale by geoffrey chaucer read for librivox dot org by tony addison in older days of the king arthur of which that Briton speaker great honour, all was this land fulfilled of fairy. The elf queen, with her jolly company, danced full oft in many a green mead. This was the old opinion, as I read. I speak of many hundred years ago, but now can no man see known elvers more. For now the great charity and prayers of limiters and other holy frayers that search every land and every stream as thick as motes in the sun a beam, blessing halls, chambers, kitchens, and bowers, cities and burghs, castles high and towers, thorps and barns, shepherds and dairies, this make us that there be now no fairies for there as wont to walk was an elf there walketh now the limiter himself in undermeles and in morrowings and saith his matins and his holy things as he goes in his limitation women may now go safely up and down in every bush and under every tree there is none other incubus but he and he will do to them no dishonour and so befell it that this king arthur had in his house a lusty bachelor that on a day came riding from river and happened that alone as she was born he saw a maiden walking him before of which maiden anon maugre her head by very force he wrapped her maidenhead, for which oppression was such clamour and such pursuit unto the king Arthur, that damned was this knight for to be dead, by course of law, and should have lost his head, per aventure such was the statute though, but that the queen and other ladies more, so long they prayed the king of his grace, till he his life him granted in the place and gave him to the queen all at her will to choose whether she would him save or spill the queen thanked the king with all her might 
and after this thus spake she to the knight when that she saw her time upon a day thou standest yet quoth she in such array that of thy life yet hast thou no surety i grant thee life if thou canst tell to me what thing is it that women most desiren beware and keep thy neck bone from the iron and if thou canst not tell it me anon yet will i give thee leave a fort to go a twelvemonth and a day to seek and leer an answer suffisant in this matter and surety will i have ere that thou pace thy body for to yielden in this place woe was the knight and sorrowfully sickered but what he might not do all as him liked and at the last he chose him for to wend and come again right at the year's end with such answer as god would him purvey and took his leave and wended forth his way he sought in every house and every place whereas he hoped for to find a grace to learn what thing women love the most but he could not arrive in any coast whereas he might to find in this matter two creatures according in fear some said that women loved best richesse some said honour and some said jolliness some rich array and some said lust to bed and oft time to be widow and be wed some said that we are in our heart most eased when that we are e flattered and e praised he went full nigh the sooth i will not lie a man shall win us best with flattery and with attendance and with busyness be we elimed both the more and less and some men said that we do love the best for to be free and do right as us lest and that no man reprove us of our vice but say that we are wise and nothing nice for truly there is none among us all if any wight will claw us on the goal that will not kick for that he saith us sooth assay and he shall find it that so doeth for be we never so vicious within we will be held both wise and clean of sin and some men said that great delight have we for to be held stable and eke secret and in one purpose steadfastly to dwell and not be ray a thing that men us tell but that tale is not worth a rake a staler pardi we women can a nothing hailer witness on midas will ye hear the tale ovid among us other fingers smaller saith midas had under his longer hairs growing upon his head two asses ears the which a vice he hid as best he might full subtly from every man's sight that save his wife then knew of it no more he loved her most and trusted her also he prayed her that to no creature she would a tellen of his disfigure she swore him nay for all the world to whim she would not do that villainy or sin to make her husband have so foul a name she would not tell it for her own shame but natheless her thought to that she died that she so longer should a counsel hide her thought it swelled so sore about her heart that needers must some word from her a start and since she durst not tell it unto man down to a marish fast thereby she ran till she came there her heart was all afire and as a bitten bumbles in the mire she laid her mouth unto the water down bewray me not thou water with thy sound quoth she to thee i tell it and no more mine husband hath long asses eras too now is mine heart all whole now is it out i might no longer keep it out of doubt here may ye see though we a time abide yet out it must we can no counsel hide the remnant of the tale if ye will hear read in ovid and there ye may it leer this night 
of whom my tale is specially, when that he saw he might not come thereby, that is to say, what women love the most, within his breast full sorrowful was his ghost, but home he went, for he might not sojourn, the day was come that homeward he must turn, and in his way it happened him to ride, in all his care, under a forest side, whereas he saw, upon a dance ago, of ladies four and twenty and yet more, towards this ilka dance he drew full yearn, the hope that he some wisdom there should learn, but certainly, ere he came fully there, he vanished was this dance he knew not where, no creature saw he that bare life, save on the green he sitting saw a wife, a fouler white there may no man devise. Against this night this old wife gan to rise, and said, Sir Knight, here forth lieth no way, tell me what ye are seeking by your fay. Per aventure it may the better be, these older folk know much a thing, quoth she. My lever mother, quoth this knight certain, I am but dead, but if that I can sain, what thing it is that women most desire, could ye me wis, I would well quite your hire. Plight me thy troth here in mine hand, quoth she, the next a thing that I require of thee thou shalt it do, if it be in thy might, and I will tell it thee ere it be night. Have here my troth, a quoth the knight, I grant. Then, a quoth she, a dare me well avaunt, thy life is safe, for I will stand thereby, upon my life, the queen will say as I. Let's see which is the proudest of them all, that wears either a kerchief or a coal, that dare say nay to what I shall you teach. Let us go forth without a longer speech. Then rounded she a pistol in his ear, and bade him to be glad and have no fear. When they were come unto the court this night, said he had held his day as he had height, and ready was his answer as he said, Full many a noble wife, and many a maid, and many a widow, for that they be wise, the queen herself sitting as a justice, assembled be his answer for to hear, and afterward this night was bid appear. To every wight commanded was silence, and that the knight should tell in audience what thing that worldly women love the best. This night he stood not still, as doth a beast, but to this question Anon answered, with manly voice, that all the court it heard. My leisure lady, generally, quoth he, women desire to have the sovereignty, as well over their husband as their love, and for to be in mastery him above. This is your most desire, though ye me kill, do as you list, I am here at your will. In all the court there was no wife nor maid, nor widow that contraried what he said, but said he worthy was to have his life, and with that word upstart that older wife, which that the knight saw sitting on the green. Mercy, quoth she, my sovereign lady queen, ere that your court depart, do me right. I taught to this answer unto this knight, for which he plighted me his troth of there, the first of thing I would of him require, he would it do if it lay in his might. Before this court then pray I thee, Sir Knight, quoth she, that thou me take unto thy wife, for well thou knowest that I have kept thy life. If I say false, say nay upon thy fay. This knight answered, Alas, and well away, I know right well that such was my behest, for goddess love, choose a new request, take all my good, and let my body go. Nay then, quoth she, I shrew us both at two, for though that I be old and foul and poor, I nud for all the metal nor the ore that under earth is grave or lies above, but if thy wife I were, and eat thy love. My love, quoth he, nay, my damnation, Alas, that any of my nation should ever so foul disparaged be, but all for naught the end is this, that he constrained was, that needs he must wed, 
and take this older wife and go to bed. Now would a some men say, par aventure, that for my negligence I do no cure, to tell you all the joy and all the array that at the feast was made that ilka day, to which thing shortly answerin I shall, I say there was no joy nor feast at all, there was but heaviness and much a sorrow, for privily he wed her on the morrow, and all day after hid him as an owl, so woe was him, his wife but looked so foul. Great was the woe the knight had in his thought, when he was with his wife to bed he brought, he wallowed and he turned to and fro, this older wife lay smiling evermore, and said, Dear husband, Benedicite, fares every night thus with his wife as ye? Is this the law of King Arthur's house? Is every night of his thus dangerous? I am your own love, and eke your wife. I am she which that savoured hath your life, and certes yet did I you ne'er unright. Why fare ye thus with me this first a night? Ye fairer like a man had lost his wit. What is my guilt? For God's love tell me it, and it shall be amended if I may. Amended, quoth this knight, alas, nay, nay, it will not be amended never more. Thou art so loathly and so old also, and thereto comest of so low a kind, that little wonder though I wallow and wind, so would a god mine heart to would a breast. Is this, quoth she, the cause of your unrest? Yea, certainly, quoth he, no wonder is. Now, sir, quoth she, I could amend all this, if that me list, ere it were day as three, so well ye might obey you unto me. But for ye speaken of such gentleness, as is descended out of old richesse, that therefore shall ye be gentlemen. Such arrogancy is not worth a hen. Look who that is most virtuous all way, prieve and apert, and most intendeth I to do the gentle deeders that he can, and take him for the greatest gentleman. Christ will, we claim of him our gentleness, not of our elders, for their old richesse. For though they gave us all their heritage, for which we claim to be of high parage, yet may they not bequeath the for no thing to none of us their virtuous living, that made them gentlemen called to be, and bade us follow them in such degree. Well can the wise poet of Florence, that heighter Dante, speak of this sentence. Lo, in such manner rhyme, is Dante's tale, full seld upriseth by his branches smaller, prowess of man, for God of his goodness, wills that we claim of him our gentleness. For of our elders may we nothing claim, but temporal things, that man may hurt and maim. Eke every white knows this as well as I, if gentleness were planted naturally, upon a certain lineage down the line, preve and apert, then would they never find to do of gentleness the fair office, then might they do no villainy nor vice, take fire and bear it to the darkest house betwixt this and the mount of Caucasus, and let men shut the doors and go then, yet will the fire as fair and light to bren, as twenty thousand men might it behold, its office natural I will it hold, on peril of my life till that it die. Here may ye see well how that gentari is not annexed to possession, since the folk do not their operation always, as doth the fire low in its kind. For God it what? men may full often find a lord's son do shame and villainy and he that will have price of his gentry for he was born of a gentle house and had his elders noble and virtuous 
and will himself but do no gentle deeders nor follow his gentle ancestry that dead is he is not gentle be he duke or earl for villains sinful deeders make a churl for gentleness is but the renomy of thine ancestors for their high bounty which is a stranger thing to thy person thy gentleness cometh from god alone then comes our very gentleness of grace it was no thing bequeathed us with our place think how noble as saith valerius was thilcatullius hostilius that out of poverty rose to high read in senac and read eke in boesa there shall ye see express that it no dread is that he is gentle that doth gentle deeders and therefore leave a husband i conclude albeit that mine ancestors were rude yet may the higher god and so hope i grant me his grace to live virtuous lie then am i gentle when that i begin to live virtuously and waver sin and whereas ye of poverty me reprieve the higher god on whom that we believe in wilful poverty chose to lead his life and certes every man maiden or wife may understand that jesus heaven's king ne would not choose a virtuous living glad poverty is an honest thing certain this will senec and other clerkers sane whoso that holds him paid of his poverty i hold him rich though he hath not a shirt he that coveteth is a poorer wight for he would have what is not in his might but he that nought hath nor coveteth to have is rich although ye hold him but a knave very poverty is sin properly juvenal saith of poverty merrily the poorer man when he goes by the way before the thievers he may sing and play poverty's hateful good and as i guess a full great bringer out of busyness a great amender eke of sapience to him that taketh it in patience povert is this although it seem a lange possession that no wight will challenge povert full often when a man is low makes him his god and eke himself to know povert a spectacle is as thinketh me through which he may his very friendes see and therefore sir since that i you not grieve of my povert no more me reprieve now sir of elder ye reprieve me and certes sir though none authority were in no book ye gentles of honour say that men should an older white honour and call him father for your gentleness and authors shall i find him as i guess now there ye say that i am foul and old then dread ye not to be a cockerwold for filth and elder also may i thee be greater wardens upon chastity but natheless since i know your delight i shall fulfil your worldly appetite choose now quoth she one of these fingers tway to have me foul and old till that i day and be to you a truer humble wife and never you displease in all my life or else will ye have me young and fair and take your aventure of the repair that shall be to your house because of me or in some other place it may well be now choose yourself whether that you liketh this knight adviseth him and so he sacketh but at the last he said in this manier my lady and my love and wife so dear i put me in your wiser governance choose for yourself which may be most pleasance and most honour to you and me also i do no force the weather of the two for as you liketh it sufficeth me then have i got the mastery quoth she 
since I may choose and govern as me lest. Yea, Surtur's wife, quoth he, I hold it best. Kiss me, quoth she, we are no longer wroth, for by my troth I will be to you both, this is to say, yea, both a fair and good, I pray to God that I may sterve wood, but I to you be all so good and true as ever was wife since the world was new, and but I be to-morrow as fair to seem as any lady empress or queen that is betwixt the east and eke the west, do with my life and death right as you lest, cast up the curtain and look how it is. And when the knight saw verily all this, that she so fair was, and so young thereto, for joy he hent her in his armours too, his heart to bathe in a bath of bliss, a thousand times on row he gan her kiss, and she abeared him in everything, that might do him pleasance or liking, and thus they live unto their livers' end, in perfect joy, and Jesus Christ us send, husbanders meek and young and fresh in bed, and grace to overlive them that we wed, and eke I pray Jesus to short their lives that will not be governed by their wives, and old and angry niggards of dispense, God send them soon a very pestilence. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wife of Flanders by G. K. Chesterton Read for LibriVox.org by Five Pack Low and brown barns, thatched and repatched and tattered, Where I had seven sons until today, A little hill of hay your spur has scattered, This is not Paris, you have lost the way. You, staring at your sword to find it brittle, Surprised at the surprise that was your plan, Who, Shaking and breaking barriers not a little, Find never more the death-door of Sedan. Must I from more than carnage call you claimant, Paying you a penny for each son you slay? Man, the whole globe in gold were not repayment For what you have lost, and how shall I repay? What is the price of that red spark that caught me From a kind farm that never had a name? What is the price of that dead man they brought me for other dead men do not look the same. How should I pay for one poor graven steeple, whereon you shattered what you shall not know? How should I pay you, miserable people? How should I pay you everything you owe? Unhappy can I give you back your honor? Though I forgave, would any man forget? While all the great green land has trampled on her the treason and terror of the night we met, not any more in vengeance or in pardon. One old wife bargains for a bean that's hers. You have no word to break, no heart to harden. Ride on and prosper. You have lost your spurs. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Winter Winds, Cold and Blee by John Clare Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Winter winds cold and blee, chilly blows o'er the lea. Wander not out to me, Jenny so fair. Wait in thy cottage free, I will be there. Wait in thy cushioned chair with thy white bosom bare. Kisses are sweetest there, leave it for me. Free from the chilly air, I will meet thee. How sweet can courting prove? How can I kiss my love, Muffled in hat and glove, From the chill air? Quaking beneath the grove, What love is there? Lay by thy woolen vest, Drape no cloak o'er thy breast, Where my hand off hath pressed, Pin nothing there, Where my head droops to rest, Leave its bed bare. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
This world is full of beauty, but Gerald Massey. Read for riverfox.org by Glen O'Brien. www.glenobrien.net There lives a voice within me, a guest angel of my heart, and its bird light wobbles win me, to the tears I tremble start. Up evermore it springeth, like some magic melody, and evermore it singeth this sweet song of songs to me. This world is full of beauty, as other worlds above, and if we did our duty, it might be as full of love. Morn's budding, bright, melodious hour comes sweetly as of yore. Night's dowry tendernesses dower with glory evermore. But there be million hearts accursed, where no great sunbursts shine, and there be million souls athirst for life's immortal wine. This world is full of beauty, as of worlds above, and if we did our duty, it might be as full of love. If faith and hope and kindness passed, as coin, twixt heart and heart, out through the eve's tear brightness, out the sun's soul should start. The dreary, dim and desolate, where we were sunny bloom, and love should spring from buried hate, like flowers from winter's tomb. This world is full of beauty, as ours would above, and if we did our duty, it might be as full of love. Were truth our uttered language, spirits might talk with men, and God illuminated earth should see the golden age again. The birth and heart should soar in mirth like born's young poet lark, and misery's last tear wept on earth quench hell's last cunning spark. This world is full of beauty, as other worlds above, and if we did our duty, it might be as full of love. We hear the cry for bread, with pretty smiling all round. Ill and fairy in their bounty blush for man with footage crowned. What a merry would it might be, opulent for all and a, Where it's lands that ask for labour, and its wealth that wastes away. This world is full of beauty, as other worlds above, and if we did our duty, it might be as full of love. The leaf tongues of the forest, and the flower whips of the sod, the abbey that him the raptures in the ear of God, the sun wind that bringeth music over land and sea, every each a voice that singeth this sweet song of songs to me. This world is full of beauty, as other worlds above, and if we did our duty, he might be as full of love. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.